So, how is it going, everybody, on this beautiful, beautiful Wednesday afternoon? Beautiful. Ooh, don't like that. Yo, Nate, how is it going tonight? It is good to see you. It's good to see everybody, and I hope that all of you guys had a fantastic day. Tell me, tell me, I want to see, how, how did you guys' uh, day go? School, work, all the good stuff? You get up to anything interesting today? What did I do? What did I do? Well, I uh, went to classes, went to work, a little bit of homework, went to the gym. Can't complain. Pretty solid day, in my opinion. Can't, can't ask for much more than that. And now we're here. You know, that's what matters. This is the best part. You know, classes, pff, there's something. Work, it's just a source of income. The gym, uh, it's just where I get my gains. But here, here's a different story. Here is a different story because here we get to combine all of it. We get to combine all of it together. Making some gains and strengthening our minds and having great chapel-like fellowship. This is where I combine all the aspects of my day together. And you're all here with me to join in it, which makes it even better. That's what I'm talking about. Macho, I hate to say it, but you missed Sparky again last night. He called out for you, man. He, he told me to give you a message. That there has to be one final battle between the two of you at a set time and date and that he won't accept anything otherwise. Do you accept? Or do you deny the request? It's a very important conversation topic. It's very important. We gotta hear, we gotta hear man, we gotta know. But yeah, it's good to see you guys. It's good to see you guys. Cool. The bat fears you? Dude, I bet he does. That's why he doesn't show up on days like today. He only shows up when he knows that you're not around. He only shows up when he knows you're not around, man. It's crazy, man. It's crazy. But yeah, how you guys feeling about today? How you guys feeling about today? You guys ready to get into this? You guys ready to get into some Genesis 21? Some good Bible study stuff? I'm, pre I'm pretty ready. I am very pretty ready to, uh, to have a jolly good time. A jolly good show, indeed. Everybody's got to know what that's a reference to. Listen, I've been, I've been, I've been right, really trying to figure out if you guys are cultured or not. Where's, where's Jolly Good Show from? Tell me what, what TV show is the quote Jolly Good Show from? I need to know. You guys can't let me down on this one. Yo, Bray's here. He's ready for some Bible study. That's what I'm talking about. Macho Man knows what's up. He knows what it's a quote from. Cole also knows what it's from. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about, man. You guys are you guys are cultured. You guys know what's up. But yeah, it's good to see all you guys. Bray, Nate, Cole. Cole, I assume your girlfriend is here as well. Macho man. Every dude, everybody we got a good crew. We got a real good crew. Think Zev will be showing up at some point. Yeah, there there you are. There she is. Oh shoot, I got a shirt on. That's a problem. I can show you one. I can't really show you both at the same time. <laughs> you sickos. I don't know why you like seeing it so much, you know? If it encourages you guys to go to the gym as well though, you know, that's what matters to me. <laughs> Gotta encourage you guys to, to get out there, get ripped and shredded for the summer, you know, you know? But yeah. Macho Man is absolutely shredded. I mean, your name is Macho Man, so I assume you're shredded. 
But yeah, guys, I guess I'll press in real quick, and then we can uh, we can get straight into it. So, uh, yeah, Father in Heaven, I thank you so much for today. Um, at least for me, today was a beautiful day outside. Um, a day that reminds me of your goodness towards us, and how good your creation is that you have made for us to live in. Um, truly, you are a good and a beautiful and an amazing God. I pray that right now, as we dive into your word, that you might speak to me and to all of us here, that you might show us the things that you want us to learn, that you would show us the things that you want us to know about you and about the others that you have created. I pray that me um, and anybody else who shows up, that we would be your tools, your vessels for your word and your message, that we might speak the things that are pleasing unto you, the things that you would want us to speak, that we might not speak falsely. Use us for the furtherment of your kingdom, and I pray that today we might have a good, fun time discussing your word, a good time of fellowship together. Pray all of these things in your name, amen. <laughs> I missed your comment, man. I missed your comment. Oh, oh, hang on, hang on. There's another one. Hey, if you got you guys really seem to like the flex your biceps one. I don't I don't really completely understand the fascination with it, but uh I also don't have a great bicep pump today, so that's a little bit unfortunate, but hey, you guys seem to like that one a lot, so <laughs> Unfortunately, I have a long sleeve shirt on today, so it's not as easy, but all right, I'll swap us over real quick. And uh, if you guys want to pull it up as well, it's a Genesis 21. Um, I'll be reading over it real quick before we get into it. But uh, if you guys want to read along with me, feel free to pull it up. And we'll just read through it real quick. Uh, we'll be reading through the whole thing this time. Just did it because Macho Man did it. You're good, you're good. All right, so we're starting off chapter 21, verse 1. The Lord dealt with Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to his son whom Sarah bore him, and Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Now Sarah said, God has brought laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, Who would ever have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. So she said to Abraham, Cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son, but God said to Abraham, Do not be distressed because of the boy, and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named for you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bowshot. For she said, Do not let me look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy and hold fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran and his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt. At that time, Abimelech with Phicol, the commander of his army, said to Abraham, God is with you in all that you do. 
Now therefore swear to me here by God that you will not deal falsely with me or with my offspring or with my posterity, but as I have dealt loyally with you, you will deal with me and with the land where you have resided as an alien. And Abraham said, I swear it. When Abraham complained to Abimelech about a well of water that Abimelech's servants had seized, Abimelech said, I do not know who has done this. You did not tell me, and I have not heard of it until today. So Abraham took a sheep and oxen and gave them to Abimelech, and the two men made a covenant. Abraham set apart seven ewe lambs of the flock, and Abimelech said to Abraham, What is the meaning of these seven ewe lambs that you have set apart? He said, These seven ewe lambs you shall accept from my hand in order that you may be a witness for me that I dug this well. Therefore, that place was called Beersheba, because there both of them swore an oath. When they had made a covenant at Beersheba, Abimelech, with Phicol the commander of his army, left and returned to the land of the Philistines. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba, and there called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham resided in the, as an alien many days in the land of the Philistines. Sweet. There we go. There we go. Look at Macho Man as a role model, if you will. Yeah. I mean, there we go. That's what I'm talking about. Light Horseman. There we go. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So what do you guys think of this? Let's talk about it real quick. Any first thoughts come to you guys' minds going over this? You guys have anything that you uh, think is interesting? Anything that you guys particularly like about it? I mean, I got plenty of things I can talk about. But I guess we've got two kind of main stories here. We've got... Uh, you know, Isaac being born and the consequences of that with Hagar. And then we've got this second story uh, going back to Abraham and Abimelech with a covenant. So we got two kind of stories here we get to talk about today. The first one's going to be the main one I want to focus on because there's a lot of stuff here I'd like to talk about. The second part's got a little bit of stuff, but I'm not as concerned with the second half as I am the first half today. But yeah, so this isn't the this definitely isn't the first time that we've seen z similar stories. Could be another deja vu situation. If you haven't noticed a trend in the Genesis narrative so far is that there's a lot of repeating stories. You know, we just last week we talked about um how Abraham lied about Sarah being his sister a second time. Cuz if you remember there was one time earlier on in the narrative where they were passing through Egypt and Abraham lied about Sarah being his sister instead of actually being his wife. And then just last chapter, he did it a second time. It was a very similar story, but this time it was with Abimelech. And he said the exact same thing about his uh, wife. He said that she was actually his sister and lied. Um, similarly, we had a previous story uh, where Sarah commanded Abraham to kick out Hagar and Ishmael, and uh, God met them in the wilderness. Uh, if you notice, this time it ended a little bit differently. Um, and we can get into that in a second here. But we also have a similar story here with Abimelech. You know, we've come across Abimelech previously. Um, we had a previous story with Abimelech and their conflicts with Abraham. It appears that Abimelech was another, you know, somewhat greater nation at the time that Abraham was residing in. So that's interesting. So we go back to Abimelech again as well. It's interesting, uh, I'm curious what the time gap would be between this story with Ishmael and this story. Because it appears that at this point, Abraham has gone back to the land of Beersheba for this. And I can't imagine that he would have been going back to the land of Beersheba that, like very soon after Isaac's birth. I imagine that this would have taken place a while after the birth, because I don't assume that immediately after Isaac was born, that he would immediately leave his family to go to this land again. Um, so presumably this story takes a little ways off of this story, although I guess there's not really too much of a way to tell for sure. Um, that's my best guess, at least. But, yeah. So so I guess let's, break, let's go, you know, paragraph by paragraph. So we got the first paragraph here, um, the birth of Isaac, right? So, if you remember back way earlier in the story, you know, at the very beginning of Abraham's story, the very first time we meet him, God calls him to leave his family's homeland and go off to a random land that God has called him to because he's going to make a great nation of them there, 
right? And Abraham leaves, and he does exactly what God says. And God meets him several times after this and says, I'm going to make you into a great nation. Your descendants shall be like the stars. And, you know, as Abraham's life goes on and on and on, he doesn't have a son still. You know, it's kind of... <laughs> it, uh, it, his life goes on and on and on, and he doesn't have this son, right? So... Thank you. <laughs> Can I ask you a question? Yeah, absolutely, man. Absolutely. Feel free to ask any questions. Don't don't feel bad to ask anything. But yeah, so 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 from the time that Abraham was called by God, presumably him and Sarah were fairly young. Like we don't know an exact age, but presumably they were very fairly young whenever they were originally called. Um and now Abraham is a hundred years old when Isaac is born. Ah, uh, Sarah and Abraham are a hundred years old when Isaac is born. Which is crazy. And that goes back to Sarah talking about the laughter. Uh, so I want to go into that as well in a second here. Um, yeah, so, so, uh, so simple answer to your question, uh, Bustif. Yes. Um... Believe it or not, that is one thing that every Christian denomination agrees on. Um, is that Jesus is 100% God and 100% man. Uh, it's one of the mysteries of the faith. Is that somehow Jesus is inherently 100% part of the Trinity. Being God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ being God the Son. Um, while also being 100% fully incarnate human being, right? So that's like deeper language. But that's to say, yes, God, Jesus is 100% a living human being who came and died, and he's also 100% part of the Godhood. I can go more into that if you want me to. Um, so there were early Christian creeds that were written by the early church that went very deep into discussing that um so does god need someone to care for him no so god doesn't need anybody to care for him you know god is all powerful he can do anything that he wants to right um but that being said god is a god of love and a god of life and god wants to be in relationship with others right so not only is god constantly in relationship with God the Father, God the, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. You know, they're constantly in relationship with each other. But God also seeks relationship with each of us as well. Um, something that he wants all of us to be with him in fellowship with him, right? Um, so no, it is not that God needs us or that he needs somebody to be with him. It's that he chooses to want to be with us in a fellowship, right? But yeah, let me see if I can find something real quick. Uh, was it the Nicene Creed? I think it's the Nicene Creed. Yes, so let me pull this over here real quick. So this is the Nicene Creed. This is one of the very earliest church documents ever, right? So let me give some background to this to this creed, right? This is about... This is somewhere between like 100 to 200 AD, right? So if, if we're putting this into perspective, right? Jesus came and was born right between... Uh, BC and AD, right? So he was born, uh, most, mo uh, the early church thought that it was zero AD, like one AD was whenever he was born. But now historians believe that Jesus was actually born about four, uh, four BC, right? Uh, so he would have died about 30 AD, right? Uh, so that would have been like, whenever Jesus died on the cross, it would have been about 30 AD. So the church would have been already be been going for say about hundred years or so. Um, actually, let me see if I can find an exact year when the Nicene Creed was, uh, written. Because I know it was somewhere around that time, but I don't remember, um, 
don't remember the exact time. Or no, no, sorry. The Apostles' Creed was the earlier one. So the Apostles' Creed is the one that talks about Jesus being fully God and fully human. The Nicene Creed, which is the one that we have here, was about 300 AD. And this is the one to dispel any sense of the Trinity, right? So all Christians came together and they said, we need these creeds to solidify our doctrine, to put off others who would push against us and say otherwise, right? So there were a lot of Christians going around at the time that said Jesus wasn't fully God. He was a product of God, right? And they made the Apostles' Creed to say, no, no, he was 100% God and 100% human. Um, and then later on, they had to make the doctrine of the Trinity, right? And that's what this creed does, right? So if I read over it real quick, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. So this is God the Father right here that's being described. And then we have, I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consequential with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation he came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. So this is the second figure of the Trinity, God the Son. And then I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who is spoken through the prophets. And this is the third member of the Trinity. And all three of these figures make up the Godhood. One God, three persons. And then here, they end it talking about the purpose of the church. Uh, I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And real quick, let me give a addendum. This is not talking about the Roman Catholic church. This is talking about, this is a term, this is a Greek term meaning unit, like one. So whenever it's saying this, it's talking about the unified church. It's not talking about the Roman Catholic church specifically. So it says, I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. So yeah, hopefully that, I mean, absolutely bust if. If you have more questions about that, I am absolutely glad to answer them. Or anybody in chat, really. Chat, if you guys want to talk more about that kind of stuff, I can absolutely give more on that. Um, but yeah, I mean, that that's one of the earliest Christian documents that we have. And it was essentially universally accepted by the church as a uh, doctrine of the faith. If God doesn't need help, then why, when Jesus was a kid, his mother takes care of him? Yes, yeah, so so absolutely, absolutely. So so that has to do with him being 100% human as well, right? So even though he is 100% part of the divine godhood, he he chose to become in he chose to become human, right? And since he chose to become human and live the life that each of us lived, right? He had to go through all that it is that we experience as humans, right? He didn't he didn't live a life that was different from you or me or anybody else. He lived the same life that each of us live. He just did so without any sin, right? So he experienced, you know, he experienced what it was to be a child and to play. He experienced what it was to become an adult and accept responsibilities and to take on his father's trade, which if you don't know, jo Joseph, uh, Jesus' father was a carpenter by trade. So Jesus actually picked up his father's trade and became a carpenter in his adulthood life. Um, he experienced temptation, which we know from the accounts in Matthew, whenever uh, Satan tempted him in the wilderness. Um, he experienced pain and suffering on the cross and through the persecution of others. He experienced grief and loss. Uh, we see that in John 11, whenever uh, his friend Lazarus dies and we see him weeping at his tomb and on the way to there. Um, so it's to say, because he took on human form, that meant that he experienced everything that it is that we as humans experience, 
right? He, he didn't live some different life than the rest of us. He truly lived the same life that each of us do. He just did so without committing any sin. He lived a perfect life, a life without sin, right? And just because he lived a perfect life without sin doesn't mean that he didn't experience pain and and sadness and anger. Um, in the same way that if you experience pain and uh, anger and sadness, those aren't those aren't sin by any means of the of the word. Um, they're just things that we as humans experience, you know. Um, so yeah, yeah. I mean, it's absolutely it absolutely could be that whenever he was a kid, he could have, you know, called on God and angels to come minister to him and make it so that nobody had to take care of him. But then he wouldn't have really truly lived the fully human life. Um, we see that in his temptation in the wilderness, right? Uh, he had gone 40 days without food in the wilderness, and Satan tempted him to perform a miracle and turn rocks into bread so that he could eat, right? And imagine 40 days without food. You'd be really hungry. Like, you would you'd be seriously tempted to do that. But he didn't give way into abusing his power or abusing God's power and, you know, expecting God to do things for him, right? In the same way that we can't expect God to... I mean, we can pray for God to do things for us, but we can't expect God to do things for us, you know? <laughs> Dude, I mean, yeah, 40 days without food is insane. I mean, it's definitely possible. Um, I know some people who do 40-day long fasts, uh, which if you don't know, that's 40 days, no food at all, just water. Um, I know that there are some people who have done it. I actually know my, my boss at the audiovisual office, he actually did a 40 day fast at one point in his life. Um, it's crazy. It's absolutely like serious props to people who can pull off the, the 40 day water fasts. Absolutely. But yeah, man, I hope, I hope I'm helping out here. Yeah. If there's anything that you want more help on absolutely let me know or let chat know we will absolutely help you out man chat hopefully this has been helpful for you guys too i know it's been a i know it's a little bit off off the genesis 21 topic but it's important stuff you know like this is this is important stuff for all of us to to talk about um so yeah i know it's a little bit off topic but hey i hope this stuff has been really helpful for all of you guys. Cole, I was going to say you and uh you and your girlfriend. Uh sorry, I still don't know your name, so I'll have to call you Phoenix still. Um but yeah, no, I I I mean I imagine you guys are pretty familiar with like the the Nicene Creed and everything. Um cuz I know more uh like Catholic and Anglo-Catholic type denominations tend to use the creeds more often than a lot of Protestant churches. Um, or not even a lot of Protestant churches, just a lot of uh, Baptist and Pentecostal type churches usually don't. Like I know Lutheran churches, Methodist churches, uh, Anglican churches, uh, Reformed, they usually use the creeds a lot more as well. Oh yeah, man, absolutely, absolutely. This is this is, this is is what I, I like to do, man. So absolutely, if you have any other questions, and this, this goes for all of you guys, chat. Do, like, seriously, guys, do not feel afraid to ask any questions of me or anybody else in this chat. Seriously, guys. Um, listen, we were, like, all of us need to know, like, like all of us start off somewhere. You know, Paul talks about uh, we start off with milk, right? And then we move on to meat, right? Like, as a baby, you can't eat meat. You have to drink milk. And then at some point you you move on and you eat meat as you become older and stronger in the same way that each of us is on a different point on our spiritual journey, right? Each and every one of us has a different level of knowledge about the Bible and God. And each of us has to, you know, each of us on a different part of that journey, right? And at one point I was at the milk stage. I was a baby and I needed people to, to spoon feed me this stuff. And then as I moved on, 
I mean, I still need people to feed me stuff, you know? I go to my seminary lectures and I feel still like that baby who needs to be spoon-fed milk, right? So absolutely, do not feel bad if there's anything you guys want to ask or anything, like, truly, truly. And I might not have all the answers. I know I won't have all the answers, but I can try my best. And if not, if I don't know the answer, I can refer to you guys or I can refer outwards. Um, I just want you guys to know that this is this is a place where you guys should feel safe to ask things like that. Or anything that you want to ask, really. My parents raised me Anglo Anglican Christian, which I'm not anymore because I've been born again, but they read the creeds every Sunday. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So Bray, what denomination are you a part of now? I'm curious. Yeah, I was going to say, I know Anglicans read creeds pretty much every Sunday. Methodists read creeds every Sunday. Uh, I believe uh, Lutherans do the same thing. Uh, Catholics do as well. I definitely recognize the Nicene Creed when you pulled it up. Can you send Paul Cole a link to all the Christian creeds? Yeah, um, I don't know if I can find... Ooh, there's a lot of creeds, honestly. Um, so if there's two... If there's two creeds that you want to know, it's the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. Those are two of the most foundational uh, early Christian creeds you can possibly find. So those two are really the starting ones. But really, there's an infinite number of Christian creeds. Um, like, they've made so many of them over the hundreds of years of uh, Christianity. Um, sorry, I did not mean to pin that. Uh, there we go. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Cole says whenever you can. Yeah, I could maybe find, like, a good list of creeds. It'd, pro it'd probably be pretty hard to find, like, every creed, if I'm being honest. But, yeah. Non-denominational? Hey, I gotcha, I gotcha, man. Yeah, I will say, um... Yeah, I gotcha, I gotcha. But yeah, I mean, like I said, the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, those are two very, very good ones. Those are, those are like, foundational to the Christian doctrine. So if you're looking for good ones, go with those ones. Um, but yeah, Bray, that's cool. That's cool, man. I will say, um, I have been becoming more and more acquainted with my Anglican brothers and sisters as of recent. Um, so if you, if you want to know my background personally, uh, I grew up Baptist. Um... Not Southern Baptist, uh, Independent Baptist is what I grew up as. Um, well, if this makes any sense to you guys, so I'll just go over it real quick. I grew up Baptist. Uh, in high school, I went to an Assembly of God church, which is a Pentecostal denomination. And after that, I went to uh, university and seminary under the Wesleyan Methodist denomination. So currently, I'm studying under Wesleyan Methodist uh, school, uh, which if you don't know, is actually an offshoot of the Anglican tradition. Um, so if you were here a couple weeks ago, whenever we went through the All Christian Denominations Explained video, uh, you'll remember the there were three denominations that split off of the Roman Catholics during the Reformation era. There was the Lutherans, there were the Calvinists, and then at a later date, the Anglicans split off of the Roman Catholics as well. Um, and now the Methodists are a split off of the Anglican tradition as well. Um, so just some background as well. But the Anglican tradition I've been learning a bit more about because I've been going through a... Uh, I'm taking a current class at seminary right now. It's called the Theology and Practice of Worship, which has been really, really interesting. So I've gotten to go through a lot of different traditions and how they practice um, and yeah, the Anglicans have been one that we've been learning how they practice a lot of things. So that's been pretty cool. But yeah, so, all right, what do we got here? So let's just go over this first paragraph, um, I guess. Uh, we'll take it one step at a time. So yeah, as we were talking, uh, Abraham was promised uh, a great offspring from God, a great nation, and at a hundred years old, we get Isaac. Abraham and Sarah are both a hundred years old when this happens, right? And if you remember from a previous story, um, Abraham and Sarah were 
uh, visited by God, and God told them that they were going to bear a son in their old age. And both Abraham and Sarah laughed at the comment. They laughed at God. And God, uh, you know, criticized them for that. He said, can I not do anything? Can I not give you what I've promised you, essentially? So here, right? Now Sarah said, God has brought laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. This is kind of a, an interesting, cool parallel back to that story, right? Because God criticized her for laughing at the idea that God could allow them to have a son in their old age. But now, Sarah's not laughing out of, you know, confusion or laughing out of, you know, in a weird, like in a, in a weird way. Now she's la laughing out of joy. God has brought laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. She's laughing in joy now. So the story has been turned on its head. Whereas previously, she was laughing at God for making a crazy claim. Now she's laughing with God in joy for what she has brought. Remember, she never had a son. She's 100 years old. They were looking for a... St Abraham and Sarah were looking to have a son their whole life. 80 plus years and they couldn't have a son and now 80 so years later God has fulfilled their the promise that they will have a son what a long-awaited promise you know and that's just, that's to, to show you know whenever God makes us a promise he's going to follow through on it he might not do it on our own time but he will do it you know Abraham grew impatient right and that's why him and Sarah laughed, because they grew impatient with God. You know, he had promised this over and over and over again to them, but they never saw it. And they thought, well, he hasn't done it for us yet, so let's take matters into our own hands. And that's where we get Ishmael, because they came up with their own plan that Abraham will sleep with their servant Hagar so that they have a son that way. Because they didn't want to wait on God, they wanted to take matters in their own hands, and they wanted to do it their own way. And that's how we got Ishmael. And God came back and he said, no, you will have a son with Sarah. And that's whenever they laughed. But this is to show God always fulfills his promises. He might not do it in the time frames that we want or the time frames that we like, but he will follow through on the promises that, that, he, that he promises to each and every single one of us. And this is proof of that right here, right at the very beginning of the Bible here in Genesis 21, we see proof that God follows through on his promises. And here we see again, and Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God commanded him. So we won't dwell on this one for too long, right? But the point of this one being, you know, Abraham recognized what God had done and he's holding up his end of the bargain because God commanded that every male be circumcised on the eighth day. And that's exactly what Abraham has done here. Abraham has followed through on his end of the promise. And that's what we see. That's what we see right here. So, yeah. I don't know what you guys think about this and everything, but I think it's pretty cool. But yeah, so, and yeah, guys, feel free. If you guys have any comments or concerns or questions, absolutely feel free to put them in. I'm not here to just talk to myself the whole time. I mean, I will talk to myself the whole time if that's what it comes down to. But if you guys have, seriously, if you guys have any questions or comments, feel free to put them down there. I'm, I'm, here, to, I'm here to talk and have some conversation, that's for sure. So yeah, if you, if you remember correctly, so here in this chapter, we have another story of Sarah sending Hagar away. Um, so let me recap the previous time that this happened. Um, so whenever Ishmael was originally going to be born, Ishmael wasn't actually born yet. He was still in the womb. But Sarah recognized that Hagar became pregnant and she got very jealous. And she actually kicked Hagar out. Um, at this point, God met Hagar in the wilderness and he told her to go back to Abraham and Sarah. So 
this isn't the first time that Sarah has sent Hagar away. Sarah sent Hagar away a previous time, and God met her in the wilderness and told her to go back to Abraham and Sarah because he still had plans for her there, right? And now, Sarah grows jealous of Hagar again after Isaac is born, right? So Isaac's been born, and she sees that uh, Ishmael and Isaac are playing, and she grows jealous of Hagar and Ishmael again. So this time she sends both of them out. She sends Ishmael and Hagar both out into the wilderness. But this time she tells Abraham to do so, right? So she says to Abraham, cast out the slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. And we can see that Abraham isn't on board with this, right? If you remember in a previous chapter, Abraham actually stuck his neck out for Ishmael because God came to him and said, Ishmael is not the son that I have the pro have given my promise to. I have a different son in plans for you that I will be giving you the, that I will be giving the promise. And Abraham sticks his neck out for Abraham or for Ishmael, and he says, "Listen, Ishmael is also my son, and I love him too. I want him to also inherit the promise." And God responds back by saying, "No, I do still intend for your actual your your son with your wife to inherit the promise. However," Because you love Ishmael so much, I will also allow him to become a great nation as well, on top of the inheritance that I'm giving your other son, right? So Abraham here again is distressed at this because he loves Ishmael, right? We see this again here. Abraham is distressed on account of his son, Ishmael. But God said to him, do not be distressed because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named for you, right? So this is going back to what he was saying earlier. Isaac is the one through whom I have given this inheritance. But as for the son of the slave woman, Ishmael, I will make a nation of him also because he is your offspring also. So this is going back to what we heard previously, that Ishmael will also become a great nation and receive part of the inheritance because Abraham he is also Abraham's son. So... And this, is, this, this goes along with God's plan, right? God initially sent Hagar and Ishmael back to Abraham and Sarah because he still had plans for them there. But now, now at this point, we see that God is not keeping Hagar and Ishmael there. In fact, he's saying, allow Sarah to let them leave. He's actually saying, do whatever Sarah tells you to do. And at this point, it seems clear it's because God has other plans for Hagar and Ishmael. That they are going to start their own nation outside of the land that has been promised to Abraham. Because if you remember right, God promised this specific land for Abraham and his descendants to inherit. So Hagar and Ishmael, they can't become a great nation in this specific land because God's already promised this land to Isaac. So we see that God allows Hagar, or he allows Sarah to kick out Hagar and Ishmael because he wants Hagar and Ishmael to go to a different land so that he can make Ishmael into a great nation somewhere else, right? So this is going along exactly with what God wants of his people, right? So we see here, Abraham treats them very kindly. So he rises up early in the morning, he takes bread and a skin of water and gives it to Hagar. He puts her on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away, and she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba, right? But this isn't where their story ends, because God meets them out in the wilderness once again, right? So the water's gone, and Hagar fears for the child's life, because there's no more water left, and they don't know where they're going. So she puts Ishmael away, because she thinks that he's going to die, and she doesn't want to see it. So God meets her again in the wilderness. This is the second time that God meets Hagar personally. And he says to her from heaven, What troubles you? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. Right? So this is God meeting Hagar again. And he's telling her, don't be afraid because I am with you. I will protect you and I will keep you safe. And I have plans for the boy. I have plans for your boy. So go find him. I will make a great nation of him. And as this happens, God provides a well of water for Hagar and Ishmael to live. 
right? So then we see that Hagar and Ishmael eventually make it back to their homeland. Because if you remember, Hagar is an Egyptian slave that was gifted to Abraham and Sarah during their time in Egypt. So Hagar and Ishmael make their way back to their homeland in Egypt, where God provides Ishmael with a wife. And then we'll see that later on, we're going to see that Ishmael becomes a great nation as well. So Isaac is promised the land of Israel, which we don't know that it's going to be the land of Israel yet. But later on in the narrative, we find out that Isaac will become the son of Jacob and Jacob will be the founder of Israel, right? So God fulfills his promise with Isaac of making him into a great nation. And now Ishmael as well, also being the son of Abraham, has gone back to the land of Egypt where he will also be made into a great nation. So I know we talked about this last time, but I don't know who all was here for the last time we had this conversation. So I guess we can talk about it again. Here's, here's an interesting thing, right? We see here in this narrative, just like we did in the last time that God met Hagar, that God cares about all people, regardless of who they are. And he loves each of us individually as his children and as his created people. And, you know, typically as Christians, we tend to think, Oh, well, that's a New Testament teaching, right? Because if you read the Old Testament, you get this idea that, oh, well, Israel is God's chosen people and the other nations don't matter so much to him. And then it's not until we get to the New Testament where, oh, well, Jews and Gentiles uh, are on the same level. You know, all people are on the same level as Israel at this point now because Christ has died for all people now. So all people are God's people. And that's what a lot of people think about the Bible, right? But in reality, we see from the very beginning of the narrative that God really has always been for all people, regardless of who they are. It's not that God has just been part of the nation of Israel or is just part of the church. No, God truly does care about the well-being of all people, regardless of who they are, right? So think about this in the eyes of an old Israelite or an old Jew who has very traditional values about uh, so, th so, so they would think, right, if you're in good standing with God, you have to be an Israelite or a Jew, you have to be male, uh, you have to be a free man, not a slave, and like all these other criteria, right? And we see here somebody who is not any of those things, right? Like this would have been so foreign to somebody back then living in Israel or a Jew who was reading over these, they would have seen, oh, She's a woman that God is speaking to. God doesn't do that, does he? And, and she's not even Israelite. She's an Egyptian. The Egyptians were the people who, who enslaved our people for hundreds of years. And God's speaking to, to an Egyptian? And not only this, but she was a slave. She wasn't even a free person. So she fit all three of the criteria that an Israelite or a Jew would say, whoa, no, I'm not, I'm not associating with them. They're, they can't possibly be somebody God's in contact with right? This is the epitome of who the Israelites and Jews would have looked down on. And we see that God reaches out to her specifically and cares for her, calls her by name from heaven. What troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy. Come lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. God has always been for all people, regardless of who they are. God loves all people, regardless of who they are. And he wants to see all people come to him. And we see this right here from the very beginnings of scripture here in Genesis. This isn't a New Testament teaching. This is a teaching throughout the whole Bible that God loves all people and wants to see the best for them. And we as Christians are called to do exactly the same thing. We as Christians are called to see all people as equal in the eyes of God and all people as broken human beings who are in need of God in their life. Because after all, we were the exact same way, right? We can't judge others for being terrible sinners whenever we ourselves 
were terrible sinners in need of God to come into our lives, right? We still are broken, terrible sinners who are in need of God to constantly work in us and to create us to be better human beings, right? So as the church, if we read the letters of Paul, he addresses this very clearly, right? So like I was saying, you know, in the eyes of a Jew or in the eyes of an, of an Israelite, if you weren't part of the Israelite Jewish nation, if you weren't a male, and if you weren't a free man, you weren't, you know, in the right standing. You know, you had to be all three of those things to be in the right standing with God. And if we read Paul's letters, he turns that up on his head. And he says, among you in the church, there is neither Jew or Gentile, there is neither male or female, and there is neither free or slave, because all of us are part of the body of Christ, all equal in his eyes, all loved by him, and all are being brought to him so that we might be in right relationship with him once again. This is not a New Testament teaching that comes from the words of Jesus or Paul. This is a teaching all throughout the Bible. And I find that too, so many Christians miss this about the Old Testament. They miss stories like this and stories with Rahab and stories with all these other people that don't seem at first glance that they might be, you know, important characters or important people, but that God shows no, they are also loved by me just as much as I love my people Israel or my people in the church. Because remember, all of us, every single one of us are broken human beings. All of us have sinned against God, right? I mean, John 3, 16, the most popular verse in the whole Bible for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him might not perish but have everlasting life because each and every one of us is on the track to death. Each and every single one of us has sinned and is deserving of death. Each and every single one of us falls into that category. But at the same time, God loves the whole world, every single person enough that he will provide for them and love them if we all but believe on him. And if you remember as well, we had Genesis 12, right? Or Genesis 15, sorry. Genesis 12 is when we met Abraham. Genesis 15 is when we get the covenant between Abraham and God, right? And at this point, Abraham has done everything that God has asked of him. He's left his hometown. He's left his family. He's gone to this foreign land and he's done everything that God's asked of him for probably decades, right? And none of those are what counted Abraham as righteous in God's eyes. The only thing that counted Abraham as righteous in God's eyes is his faith in him. And that is very clearly laid out in, in Genesis chapter 15, where it says that God counted Abraham's faith that made him righteous. And in the same way, we saw in the last time that God met Hagar that she put faith in God and named him. And here we see that God has delivered her and her son from death. That, she, that he has delivered them to, to a good life. And I don't know about you guys, but I find all that very, very inspiring. It, it, it really does go to show the true character of the God that we worship, the God that we follow, the God that loves all of us so deeply that he doesn't want to see us go astray, that he wants all of us to come back to him. He isn't like gods of other religions that claim God is a judgmental and dictator-like creature. The God of the, of the Bible is a God that is loving, who is caring. That's what sets our God apart from the gods of any other religion. And what I believe makes him the true God is that he cares for each and every single one of us. That he loves each of us very deeply. 
that he wants to see the best of us. That he himself would become a sacrifice and die on the cross for us because he loves us that much. The gods of any other religion wouldn't do anything like that. They're too high above us to even consider such, such a demeaning act. But our God's different. And that's, that's what makes him the true God. The one true God. So yeah, I don't know what you guys think about all that. I've just been kind of going off uh, here, I guess, but yeah, I guess we've got a little bit more to go over here. So yeah, so we've got this little section here. It's kind of a different story. I figured this isn't a big enough story for its own Bible study or its own stream, but we can go over it here. Um, but yeah, if you guys have any questions or comments about this first story here with uh, Isaac, Hagar, and Ishmael, let me know. You know, we kind of went over that pretty quickly. I think I covered everything that I wanted to here, but if I think of anything, I can come back to it. Or if you guys think of anything as well, let me know. We can go back to it as well. Um, but yeah, so we got one other little story down here between Abraham and Abimelech again. And it's a little bit odd, in all honesty. I'm still not entirely sure what to make of it. I have, you know, it, it kind of makes sense, I guess. But, yeah, so so I guess let's get into it. So, so here, um, like I said, this is, a, a, presumably, this is a little while after this story. Because I don't imagine that Abraham would have left his newborn child uh, very early. I imagine he would have he would have done this a little bit afterwards, right? So this is probably a little ways after the previous story. Uh, but if you remember, Abraham has had multiple interactions with King Abimelech previously, right? And their last interaction wasn't so great, right? The last time that Abraham and Abimelech met together, um, there was this very not-so-great story where Abraham lied about his wife being his sister, and Abimelech went to go take Sarah as his wife, and God met Abimelech and said, yeah, you're going to be a dead man if you sleep with her because she's already taken by this guy, Abraham. And Abimelech says, I didn't know and I haven't done anything yet, so will you curse me for doing something that I haven't already done? And God essentially says, listen, you haven't done anything and I understand that. If you make up with Abraham, then your people will not be cursed for the things that you were planning to do. So the last time we met them, they made up and Abraham and Abimelech went their own separate ways again, right? So Abraham was living in Abimelech's land for a while, and that's what we see here as they're talking. Abimelech is telling Abraham, but I've dealt loyally with you and you with me and with the land where you have resided as alien because Abraham was an alien in Abimelech's land, right? So Abimelech here is uh, acknowledging Abraham's God, right? And he's saying, God is with you in all that you do, and I recognize that. So Abimelech is recognizing all the good things that God has done for Abraham. And Abimelech is asking Abraham uh, to ask his God, essentially here we see, now therefore swear to me here by God that you will not deal falsely with me or with my offspring or with my posterity. And then he appeals saying, you know, I've dealt loyally with you and with the lands you have resided here and Abraham says, I swear it, right? So here we see uh, Abimelech, you know, asking Abraham, saying, I recognize what your God's done for you. Will you swear to me that you and your God will not turn on me or deal falsely with me? And Abraham makes a covenant with him, right? And here we see the covenant that Abraham and Abimelech make, right? So Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them to Abimelech, and the two men made a covenant. Um, and if you weren't here a couple weeks ago, whenever we talked about ancient uh, covenant, this was a very important thing, right? So they didn't have like formal legal contracts back then, obviously. But one thing that they did have was formal covenants. And these covenants were recognized in pretty much the same way that a legal binding contract would be today. So they would meet up and they would uh, do some kind of ceremony, like a sacrificial ceremony, right? And that would bind their agreements together by blood. Right? So that's kind of what we see here, right? So they're taking sheep and oxen and making a covenant together. 
So this, the words that they set up here, they are now set in stone by blood sacrifice, right? So that's how they did it back then. That's how they made covenant back then was by doing that. Um, and here we see, uh, these seven ewe lambs you shall accept from my hand in order that you may be a witness for me that I dug this well, right? And this isn't the, this, this seems like an odd thing, although you have to remember, well, I guess not remember because this is going to be in future stories, but digging wells together was a very significant thing during this time in human history, right? And I don't know the exact significance behind it, but we see this later on. We see Jacob digs a well with people as well. And, like, there's all these stories of people digging wells together as sort of a sign of relationship together, right? And it marks a specific land where these wells are dug, right? So here we see, when they made the covenant at Beersheba, uh, therefore the place was called Beersheba because they both then swore an oath, right? And Beersheba means well of seven or well of oath, if you see that down here. Um, which is interesting, right? Because we've seen throughout pretty much this whole story, uh, this place called Beersheba. We even saw it earlier in this chapter that Hagar went out into the wilderness of Beersheba. Uh, but it wasn't called Beersheba yet, because this is whenever the place got its name, Beersheba, was with this covenant between God and Abraham. So that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. And here we see again, Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba, and there called in the name of the Lord, the everlasting God, and Abraham resided as an alien many days in the land of the Philistines. And I don't mean to end on a sad note, but here we see the downfall of Abraham's family. Kind of. In a weird way, right? I mean, obviously it's not the full downfall of Abraham's family, right? Because Isaac and Ishmael both become a great nation, right? However, that being said, I had a very smart professor in my undergrad point out that there is a trend that begins to take place in the narrative following this verse, right? That being that Abraham's family is divided from this point on, right? So Hagar and Ishmael, so, so all of them live together, right? We had Hagar and Ishmael, Abraham, Isaac, and Sarah, they all lived together. It wasn't necessarily a very happy family, but they lived together, right? And they made they made do together, right? And then we see here that Sarah kicks out Hagar and Ishmael, and they are permanently gone, right? They don't come back to Abraham, Sarah, and Isaac. They're gone in the land of Egypt now. So there we see the first, uh, well, actually, even before this, we saw Lot split off from Abraham, right? Abraham, Lot split on, Lot is uh, Abraham's nephew, if you don't know. So Abraham's nephew, Lot, who came with Abraham and Sarah to this land that God called him, Lot splits off of Abraham and Sarah to go be in his land, right? And now Hagar and Ishmael, they have split off as well. And now we see that Abraham is residing in the land of the Philistines. Abraham, now that Isaac is born, he's not even with Isaac and Sarah for a time being, right? Which is crazy, right? You'd think, oh, Isaac's born, of course they're gonna be together, but we see here for a time, they're not even gonna be together for a little while. And of course, Abraham's gonna go back to be with Sarah and Isaac, but we see that this is a beginning of a trend where Abraham's family is gonna be more split up due to family conflicts moving forward, right? So then next, next chapter, we're gonna have the sacrifice story and everything, but then, Chapter 23, we see that Sarah is going to die. Sarah lived 137 years, and this was the length of her life. And near the end of this story, we see that all of Abraham's family has to gather together to be there. Because they all were so split up that once they hear about it, they have to come back together to be with her. And that's about that's 37 years from the time that this happened to the time of her death. So that's a long time for Abraham's family to be fairly divided. It's a fairly sad way to kind of move on with this story. But I guess that's just the direction that their family went due to family conflicts. 
But that's not the end of the story, obviously, as we know, because Isaac is going to become a great nation, that being the nation of Israel, right? And Ishmael is also going to become a great nation here in the land of Egypt. So we see that it's not the end of the story. It's going to go upwards. There's dips. There's dips and there's turns and there's curves all throughout this biblical narrative. There's ups and downs all along the way. But we know that the general trend is up. Up until we get to Jesus. Jesus being the ultimate climax of the story where all things begin to be set right once again. And that's what we're working to. And that's where we see this promise. Right? Jesus being the long descendant of Abraham. God promised a great nation to come from Abraham. And not only do we get a great nation from Abraham, we get the Son of God who came to be a sacrifice for each of us as well. So yeah. That's all I've got for chapter 21. I don't know, what do, what do you guys, you guys have anything you guys want to, uh, you guys have anything for me? Because I was going to say, I don't really have much else to go over for chapter 21. That's pretty much all I had prepared. I went through it a lot faster than I thought I would, but. Yeah, I don't know. What do you guys think? Because if we don't have anything else, um, that's all I had planned. I don't have anything else planned for the night. I know it went by fairly quickly, but... Cole, I guess I could I could find you a list of creeds. Here, we can do it together. Uh, Christian creeds. Christian creeds of... Uh, list of Christian faith. Let's see what Wikipedia says. Let's see if Wikipedia is good. Um, oh, the Chalcedonian Creed is also a good one. Actually, let's go over these. Yeah. Um, so these are the big ones, the historic creeds, right? So we got the Apostles' Creed. Let's do this one real quick. So this is the Apostles' Creed. Um, this is a very, very big one. Does it have it? Does it have a te uh, text of it here? Oh yeah, here we go. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and His and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, who suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, descended into hell, rose again from the dead on the third day, ascended into heaven, at the, and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, who will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So this is the first, like, major creed of the Christian faith, right? Um, and we see a year for that here. Uh, product of Roman Christians around 180 AD who, critique, who developed an early form of the Apostles' Creed, possibly to critique Marcion. Um, so Marcion being... Uh, he had a belief about Christianity um, that ended up becoming the... Marcion heresy. Um, actually, I don't remember what the Marcion heresy was. Uh, yeah, preached that God had sent Jesus Christ, who was an entirely new alien God, distinct from the vengeful God of Israel who had created the world. So he believed that Jesus was like a separate entity, a separate God, not in line with God the Father. Um, so that's why this creed was made. Um, and then this one, the, the creed of the Nice of Nicaea, um, uh, so there's two of them here, if you see, Creed of Nicaea and the Nicene Creed. This is an expansion and revision of the Creed of Nicaea. So it's essentially the same thing, it just adds the Philoic Clause. Um, so, so I can explain that. But let's go over this first. So the Creed of Nicaea, 3, 325, uh, and it's the product of the Council of Nicaea, which tried to solve the Arian heresy, which if you don't know, let me pull this up. The Arian heresy was a series of Christian disputes between the nature of Christ that began a dispute between Arius and Athanasius. Uh, Athanasius ended up becoming the one that was agreed with and Arius became the heresy. Uh, this is because Arius believed that, you know, essentially Jesus was not completely God, right? He, he said, you know, 
there's no intermixing of the natures of 100% God, 100% human. He's one or the other, right? And Athanasius said, no, he has to be both. And that's why we get the Creed of Nicaea. The Nicene Creed 381 is an expansion of this previous creed. And pretty much all it adds is the Philoete Clause. And it's like, a, it's like three words, right? Right? Uh, actually, let me pull this one up. And let me pull up the text because I can show you what the Philoete Clause is. Um, or wait, actually, actually, uh, it's not going to show up here. It'll show up, uh, it'll show up here. So if I can find the text. Um, where is the text? The Philoete Controversy. Latin liturgical version. Here we go. English trans translation of the Armenian version. The Philoete Clause is... Where is it at? I forget where it's at. I know the words, but I don't remember where they're at in the thing. Where is it? Essentially, it's just uh, adding and the sun is the Philly clause. So let me go up here and just read what it says up here, because maybe it'll say where it's at. I know the, the Philly clause is just adding and the sun because they didn't believe that he came from. Yeah, the word Philly is and the sun, right? In the description of the procession of the Holy Spirit. So this is to say that the Philly clause adds that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the father and the son. But that was a controversy because some people said that, no, the Holy Spirit does not proceed from the Father and the Son. He only proceeds from the Father. So that's what this controversy was. And this is what was added to the creed later on, essentially. Yeah. I know, I know. Actually, this isn't out of the Bible, though. This is creeds, this is creeds from the tradition of the church. This isn't from the Bible. So I don't know if we should use the... The opening the Bible emote or not. <laughs> no, but these the, even though these things aren't from the Bible, they're very, very, very important to Christian faith. Um, and let me give you an example. So, so a lot of people would find that very controversial, right? Like a lot of people would say, no, we need the Bible alone, right? We don't need anything outside of the Bible. But let, let me give you an example of why these are important to Christian faith. The Bible doesn't say anything about the Trinity. Believe it or not, the Bible does not say, any, it does not use the word Trinity. It does not form a Trinitarian doctrine, nothing. The reason we have the Trinity is because of these creeds. These creeds are the things that take what is in the word of God and formats it into a doctrine that Christians can understand. Things like the Trinity, things like the nature of Jesus, things like that. So that's why these are important because they break down what the Bible says and it edits it down into something that we as Christians can understand better. Oh, you're playing? Okay, I gotcha, I gotcha. I thought you were using it in response to what I was saying. <laughs> um, so can we get the Chalcedon Creed or the Chalcedon definition, also known as the Chalcedon Creed, as a declination of Christ's nature uh, you know, being both 100% human and 100% God. Chalcedon was a figure. The Council of Chalcedon was summoned to consider the Christological question in light of the one nature view of Christ proposed by Eutychus, uh, right? So this is saying, no, Christ has to be only one nature. He can't be two. And Chalcedon being the one that says, no, no, that he, he's 100% God and he's 100% human. He has to be both at the same time, right? The council first solemnly ratified the Nicene Creed adopted in 325, and that creed was amended by the first council of Constantinople in 381. It also confirmed the authority of two synodical letters by Cyril of Alexandria. Um, so the content. The full text of the definition reaffirms the decisions of the Council of, Euph uh, of Ephesus, the preeminence of the Creed of Nicaea, and the further definitions of the Council of Constantinople. So this is affirming these two things, right? And it's saying that the view of one nature is a heresy, right? So we see down here, the definition implicitly addressed a number of popular heretical beliefs. 
The reference to co-essential with the father was directed at Armenianism, right? And co-essential with us is directed at Apollinarianism. Two natures unconfused unchangeably refutes Eutychianism, and indivisibly, inseparably uh, is against Nestorianism. So this, this essentially, this creed is combating four heresies that were very popular at the time, right? And so here's, here's essentially what it says. Following then, the Holy Fathers, we all unanimously teach that our Lord Jesus Christ is to us one and the same Son, the self-same perfect in Godhead, the self-same perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man, the self-same of a rational soul and body, co-essential with the Father according to the Godhead, the self-same co-essential with us according to the manhood, like us in all things, sin apart. Before the ages begotten of the Father as to the Godhead, but in the last days the self-same for us and for our salvation, born of Mary the Virgin, Theoko Theotokos, as the manhood, one and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, acknowledged in two natures, unconfused, unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably, the difference of the natures being in no way removed because of the union, but rather the properties... Oh, shoot. Hey, thanks, Cole. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Dude, that's awesome. Cole, that is... Dude, I can't thank you enough, man. That's awesome. That's a huge help to the channel, honestly. I appreciate that a ton, man. Dude, Cole, I can't thank you enough for, for all that you do for this channel, truly. You, you're a huge help, man. I appreciate you being here. You're awesome. <laughs> oh but yeah so so okay sorry sorry i got distracted where was i where was i um but rather the properties of each nature being preserved and both concurring into one person and one hypostasis not as though he was parted or divided into two persons but one and the self-same son and only begotten god word lord jesus christ even as from the beginning the prophets have taught concerning him and as the lord jesus himself christ himself hath taught us and as the symbol of the fathers hath handed down to us so yeah this is the this is the Chalcedonian definition, right? So that's another really important one. And then this one, I don't remember this one to be honest. The Athanasian Creed? I don't remember this one to be honest. Uh, I might remember it once I start reading it, but we can go over this one as well. Uh, let me do something real quick before I forget. There we go. You've made it to the subscriber tier on Discord too. <laughs> So whoever will be saved, before all things, it is necessary that we that he hold the Catholic faith, which faith, unless every one do keep whole and undefiled without doubt, he shall per perish everlastingly. And the Catholic faith is this, that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity. Uh, and again, Catholic meaning like the one church, not the Roman Catholic church, the Catholic meaning one church. Um, for there is one person of the Father, another of the Son, and another of the Holy Ghost. But the Godhead of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost is all one. The glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. Such as the Father is, such is the Son, and such is the Holy Ghost. The Father, uncreated. The Son, uncreated. And the Holy Ghost, uncreated. The Father, unlimited. The Son, unlimited. And the Holy Ghost, unlimited. The Father, eternal. The Son, eternal. And the Holy Ghost, eternal. And yet, they are not three eternals, but one eternal. As also, there are not three uncreated, but three infinites, and not one, but one uncreated and one infinite. So likewise, the Father is almighty, the Son almighty, and the Holy Ghost almighty. And yet they are not three almighties, but one almighty. So the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God. And yet they are not three gods, but one God. So likewise, the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, and the Holy Ghost Lord. And yet not three lords, but one Lord. For like we are all compelled by the Christian verity to acknowledge every person by himself to be God and Lord, so are we forbidden by the Catholic religion to say there are three gods or three lords. The Father is made of none, neither created nor begotten. The Son is of the Father alone, not made nor created, but begotten. The Holy Ghost is of the Father and of the Son, neither made nor created nor begotten, but proceeding. 
So there is one Father, not three fathers, one Son, not three sons, one Holy Ghost, not three Holy Ghosts. And in this Trinity, none is before or after another, none is greater or less than another, but the three, but the whole three persons are co-eternal and co-equal. So that in all things, as foresaid, the unity in Trinity and the Trinity in unity is to be worshipped. He, therefore, that will be saved, let him thus think of the Trinity. Furthermore, it is necessary to everlasting salvation that he also believe faithfully the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. For the right faith is that we believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is God and man, God of the substance of the Father, begotten before the worlds, and man of the substance of his mother, born in the world perfect God and perfect man of a reasonable soul and human flesh subsisting, equal to the Father as touching his Godhead and inferior to the Father as touching his manhood, who although he is God and man, yet he is not two but one Christ, one not by conversion of the Godhood into flesh, but by the assumption of the manhood into God, one altogether not by confusion of substance, but by unity of person. For as the reasonable soul and flesh is one man, so God and man is one Christ, who suffered for our salvation, descended into hell, rose again the third day from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from whence he will come to judge the living and the dead. At whose coming all men will rise again with their bodies, and shall give account for their own works. And they that have done good shall go into life everlasting, and they that have done evil into everlasting fire. This is the Catholic faith, again, one faith, which, except a man tr believe truly and firmly, he cannot be saved. So I do remember this one now that I read over it. I just don't, I, uh, the other ones I just feel like are the more well-known ones. But this first half essentially is just talking about the Trinity. And this second half is essentially affirming uh, the nature of Christ is essentially what it boils down to. But yeah, so those are the creeds. I mean, these are the main creeds. Like there's so many other ones, like the Dash A uh, is a really, really important. Uh, it's a longer document. Um, it's essentially like, it's essentially like a teaching of the uh, it's a passing down of the early tradition, right? So actually there's a definition here. The Dinashe, also known as the Lord's teaching through the 12 apostles to the nations, is a brief anonymous early Christian, te Christian treatise written in Greek dated by modern scholars to the first or second century AD. So this is just like a long document about ancient teaching. Um, there's a couple other ones here. I don't recognize all of them. Um, Interdominational creeds. The Barman Declaration is an important one. That's a more recent one. Um, I, re I remember that one. Uh, brief Statement of Faith. This is a good one. Um, ecumenical Creeds. Uh, some of these are good as well. Uh, and then there's specific denominational ones as well. So here's a couple Anglican ones. Um, wow, there's a lot of Baptist ones. What in the world? I would not expect that. Confessions of faith, uh, yeah. But yeah, so that's to say these are the important ones. These ones right here are the, are the important creeds to, like if there's ones that you're gonna be looking for, those, those would be the ones. But yeah. So does that uh, satisfy you guys? Does it, uh, Cole? Cole and company? Or do you guys want me to talk more about these? I mean, that's pretty much all I know about these ones, to be honest. But hopefully that's a help. Hopefully, at least. Hopefully that's a help. But yeah, if you guys have questions or anything... Okay, sweet, yeah. Yeah, hopefully that was helpful and everything. Yeah, anything else you guys want to talk about? Like I said, I, uh... I did everything that I planned to do tonight. It went by pretty quickly, but then again, we are coming up on the two hours. So if you guys wanted to, um, like we could talk about a couple other things before we hit the two hour mark, or uh, also we could go over prayer requests and find a cool other channel to go check out. What do you guys think? Let me put up a poll for you guys. Poll. Question. Tonight. Answer. 
and sweet so let's do that but yeah okay so you guys can vote on that however if you do vote for the first one we're gonna have to vote on other things so we could do chat gpt we could uh we could mess around with some other creeds and discussion and stuff like that there's other things we could do for that but otherwise we could do prayer requests in a raid And yeah, so if you guys don't know, um, I, I ask that you guys stick around for a little bit longer if we do the raid. Um, so what we do is, uh, we're a Christian channel. We make that pretty clear, I'd say, through our, you know, the channel's called God's Gamers. And we have the Christian tag and the church tag and all that stuff. Um, so, you know, what we like to do as the community of this channel we like to end our streams by raiding another fellow Christian streamer and showing them the same type of love that you guys show this channel, right? Uh, you know, help other people out and bring a, a smile to their face for the day, you know? Like, every time we go raid another fellow Christian streamer, it lights up their whole day. They get a big smile on their face. They have a great night. And we love doing that. We like doing that as a community. We like to brighten up people's day and... Yeah, just, just, you know, show them that God loves them. So what we do is we go into the channel, we type into the chat that God loves them, and we just show them a good time, you know? Even if you can only stay for a couple minutes to chat, it still brings a good, like, a great smile to their face. Especially if people actually stay and chat for a little bit. It, it makes a huge impact on, on their night. And we love to do it. So... But yeah, we can we can start trying to find a channel here. Let me let me pull up. Uh, seems like it's going that direction. So let me pull up Twitch, and we'll find a uh, we'll find a channel. So yeah, we go on. We type in the Christian tag. We type in the Christian tag, and we're gonna sort low to high, and we're just gonna look for a similar type game that we typically play. Um. This guy's playing Jedi Survivor. Have you guys actually seen this game yet? I played the original one, uh, Fallen Order. Jedi Fallen Order was a fantastic game. I've been wanting to play this one, but I haven't had time. So we could go do this one, or we could keep going for a little bit. Uh, these are getting into some other type of games that we might not play. So yeah, we think in we think in this guy. Let me pull him up real quick. Let's look at the lightsabers. Christian husband seminary. Oh, he's a seminary graduate. That's awesome. How about that? Does he say where he graduated? I'll ask him whenever we go raid. I'll ask him when we go raid where he went to seminary, because I'm curious now. But yeah, so so let me swap over real quick. Uh, we can go so, to some prayer requests and stuff. Um, intermission. So, prayer requests. Um, first and foremost, uh, if you guys haven't seen already in the Discord, um, we have a prayer request for Cole's cousin, uh, who was just diagnosed with diabetes. Um, so be praying for, for them. Uh, I have family members who have diabetes, and I know it's not something that is very fun to live with. Um, so absolutely, please be praying for Cole's cousin and everyone else involved there. Uh, it would mean a ton. Uh, also, prayer request-wise, uh, yesterday during stream, we had a lot of people stop by and talk about how they were worried about finals coming up and final exams and papers and stuff like that. Um, I'm not there yet. I still have a couple more weeks of school, so maybe not be worrying about me as much. But if you want to pray for me in school, absolutely go for it. But uh, for sure, the people uh, that need prayer the most right now is the people who have finals this week. Uh, I know there's quite a few of them. Uh, they're worried about their final exams and papers and everything. So please be praying for them that they might, you know, remember the things that they studied and to be able to do well on them. Um, also, uh... Let me pull up the name again. I forget the name. Uh, but there's another... There's a family as well. Um, 
She's a friend of ours up here at seminary. Uh, her friend, or her son Jace, was just admitted to the emergency room. Uh, he's a very young son to her, and we pray that you keep both of them in your prayers as well. Um, but yeah, I can't think of really any other major prayer requests at the time. If you guys have any other prayer requests, put them in the chat, um, and we can get them out there real quick before we head out. But yeah, if you want to be praying for them. Uh, any of those things, uh, please be doing so. It means a lot. Prayer really does work wonders, guys. Prayer really does work wo work wonders. Absolutely. No doubt about it. Um, but yeah, let me, uh, let me give us a benediction real quick, um, as we head out, head back out into the world. Um, so yeah, as we depart from this place to go back into our work lives and our school lives back out into the world um just know that you are a deeply loved child of god that you no matter who you are no matter what ethnicity you come from whether you're male or female regardless of who you are what your background is you are loved child of God. Just as God loved Hagar, the slave Egyptian, one of the lowest of society back then, God loves you and every person equally. And let's remember as we go into this week ahead that, that God does love all people equally. That, that all people, regardless of who they are, even our greatest enemies, God wants to see them come back to him. So let's remember to treat people that way going into our week ahead. And also remember that God fulfills his promises. If God has promised you something, he will fulfill it. As he fulfilled the promises to Abraham in his life to provide for him a son to become a great nation, he will provide for you whatever promises he has given you. I pray that as we go back out into the world that we remember these things. And I send you back out into the world to be his servants, his children. And I'll start the raid timer. Again, as we go out into this person's stream, let them know that God loves them very much. And show them a good time. Even if you can only stay for a couple minutes to chat with them, I promise you it brightens up their day a whole lot. Oh, I'm sorry, Chi. Oh, I feel bad now. We're leaving you right on a cliffhanger. Hey, I, if you really, if you want to go back and watch it, it was a pretty good one. We talked about. Uh, I'll give you a quick recap in case you want to go back and watch it. We talked about uh, Hagar and Ishmael. Um, no, you're good. I'll just give you a recap real quick. So we talked about uh, Hagar and Ishmael and the birth of Isaac. Uh, God meeting Hagar and Ishmael in the wilderness, and then. Uh, you know, how God provided a great nation for uh, Ishmael and how he provided for them. So it's a fairly shorter one. Uh, it was about an hour or so long, but it was a shorter chapter. So uh, right after this, it'll be posted onto the Twitch if you want to go back and rewatch it. Uh, I feel bad you coming in at the end. But hey, we're about to go raid this guy playing Fallen Order. Um, same thing as usual. You know, let them know that God loves them. And if you're able to stick by, even for just for a couple minutes to chat with them, it means a ton, you know, it really brightens up their day, having people come and chat with them for a little bit. Um, so yeah, I love each and every single one of you guys very much. Uh, Cole, thank you for the another gifted sub, that truly means a ton. Remember, 50% of everything's going, but yeah, let them know God loves them. <laughs>